Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Hello, folks, and welcome once again to another episode of Stories, a history of Appalachia. And, Rod, today we have the story of a Wise County, Virginia country doctor by the name of Lawrence Haddon. Yeah, it's a very interesting story, Steve, and if you're not familiar with the story of Lawrence Haddon, you're going to be enlightened here for the next few minutes while you listen to the podcast because all of this for him started back in England on February 16th, 1843, as Lawrence Haddon was born, and his grandfather was Stephen Haddon, who was born in West Haddon, Northampton, the English Midlands near the industrial centers of Birmingham and Leeds. We've heard of those places before in England. But his father, Samuel Lawrence Haddon, began his work as a porter in the uh, railway terminal and later became a station master. His mother was Catherine Wilson Haddon, and he had two brothers, Charles Samuel and George, and two sisters, Eliza and Polly. Here's where it gets kind of interesting because Lawrence was a very adventurous sort of lad. Uh, this was, I guess, right around the time of the Civil War, and he had heard about the Civil War and decided, you know, that sounds like a nice big adventure. He was actually thrilled by stories of, of the war between the states. So he slipped away as a steerage passenger from the port of Liverpool, England, and came over to the U.S. Fortunately, he had an uncle who had already migrated to the U.S. and lived in New Jersey and some say that the name of Haddonfield, New Jersey, came from that uncle. But mm -hmm. regardless, Dr. Haddon did end up joining the uh, Union armies under a, a very interesting sort of process. Seems that during the Civil War, if you were a uh, person living up in the United States as opposed to the Confederacy, and you had enough money, when the draft came around, you didn't have to serve. Mm -hmm. You got to pay money to other people less fortunate and not as rich as you, to go serve in your place. And Lawrence took somebody up on that, got paid some money, and ended up going to war on behalf of the uh, Vermont Regiment, if I'm not mistaken, uh, mm -hmm. in Virginia fighting General Robert E. Lee. Well, he was in the Vermont Regiment, as you said, but you know, after a period of his training, his outfit was then sent south to become a part of General Grant's army. Now, in a siege in Petersburg, Virginia, in 1864, Lawrence Haddon ended up being wounded by Confederate shrapnel, and he was captured and sent to the notorious Libby Prison near Richmond. Now, if you're not familiar with the Libby Prison, it was probably one of the worst Union Army yeah. prison camps that was, you know, of the war. There's so many of them, but still... Uh, Libby Prison was one of those that had open windows and where the elements, they were exposed to the elements almost all the time, whether it be sun, rain, snow, whatever the case may be. But he was able to go and convince his rebel captors, no doubt by his English accent, that he would rather fight with them than face disease and starvation in prison. So he joined a Southern regiment at the time, recruited mainly from southwest Virginia, and they began fighting with General Lee's army. So as they lay in the trenches, cold, hungry, in the winter of 1864 and 65, knowing that the Confederacy was going to end up as being a lost cause, Lawrence's young mountaineer comrades, either through nostalgia, just mockery, whatever the case may be, they regaled the young Englishman of a city where fame and fortune awaited him. <laughs> now, if he'd only brave the perils of the 300-mile trek that you head on down there, 300 miles, and you'll get to the place that's called Gladeville. And we know that today as Wise, Virginia. Well, of course, the early spring, Grant routed Lee's army from its fortifications at Petersburg and then forced them westward, finally to Appomattox, where on April 9, 1865, Lee surrendered to Grant. Now, each rebel soldier received a pardon and was permitted to keep his horse and go home. Now, Lawrence didn't really have a home at this point. He just followed the other soldiers back down to that major metropolis of Gladeville, slash Wise. Uh, he got out, no mustering out pay, no pension, no nothing, just a noble farewell from General Lee. We're not sure if he headed west on horseback alone through the wilderness or whether he came with someone else, but in any event, he did end up in Wise County, in the company of a young soldier whose last name was Dean. 
and that it's believed that Dean wandered into southwest Virginia with him. Uh, after journeying for many days through the backwoods, he did arrive in a hamlet of log huts, and uh, I guess, Rod, he believed this whole story about this magical city in the mountains because he asked a local uh, where Gladeville was, and the response was what? You're right in the middle of it, son. <laughs> that's what he told him, and that's what the way it went. And Lawrence, after that, well, he had, uh, had every intention in the world of eventually going back north to try to find his uncle, who had come to America, as we said, some years earlier. But one day soon after he arrived in Gladeville, or Wise, while chopping wood, and presumably at the dean's home, Lawrence cut his foot severely, and he was unable to travel for some time. And it was during this time that a young widow named Maisie White dropped in for a visit to see Lawrence. Mm -hmm -hmm. And the rest is history. Well, actually, the family's history. Well, the young widow apparently had inherited a considerable tract of land in the foothills of the Cumberlands known as, quote, the south of the mountain, close quote. And it's there that the young couple settled after their marriage in 1866. Times were hard in those Reconstruction years, but undaunted, the young Englishman showed that he was now an American with all the pioneers' faith in the future. He saw that uh, there was a need for doctors in that area, Wise County and Dickinson counties. The area was remote, of course, from doctors' care, and the only practitioners were so-called herb doctors, midwives, and granny women, as they call them. You know what a Mm. granny woman is, don't you, Rod? Yes, I do. I know exactly. Well, the most notorious in the northern areas of the county, as far as herb doctors, was somebody we talked about a couple of months ago by uh, the name of Doc Taylor, also known as the Red Fox, who, um, as we said, was involved in more mischief than medicine and was ultimately hanged in Wise early in the 1890s. You know, and we have to say, too, again, Red Fox was one of these larger-than-life people who thought he could just about do anything that his Lord Jesus Christ could possibly do, rise from the dead and be able to cure somebody. But, you know, there was a difference between what they regarded as regular medicine and mountain medicine, and Lawrence hadn't really established that. As he read books on medicine while he was in London, he began to offer aid to his neighbors. But, you know, as his reputation as a healer grew and sometimes added to his knowledge of, you know, information from further reading, the diverse mysteries and the arts of herb doctrine, his practice was fairly sound. He was successful in the treatment of diseases that were common in the mountains at the time, and particularly, more than anything else, pneumonia and dysentery. His service gained him a license to practice medicine without any formal medical training and without an examination. He knew that much. Wow. You know, medicines weren't easy for any backwoods healer to come by, Rod. And Dr. Haddon often pieced out the uh, lack with medicines of his own distilling. And when I say distilling, I mean distilling. Uh, He bought a simple hand press to print his formulas And his interest extended the use of the uh, crude machine. He printed formulas on various diseases, such as influenza, dysentery, and, in fact, was successful in saving many lives later on during World War I. Well, you know what was going on in World War I, too. They had the big flu during that time, and it was also, I think, uh, it's been known as several different names, but uh, I think that I even had some relatives. I had uh, several relatives mm-hmm. that passed away. It was known as the swine flu at one time uh, or a variation of the swine flu. But still, it was a very bad time back during the years of World War I, especially in Appalachia. But Dr. Haddon was well read on the Bible. And one of the things he did was publish various tracts. And one booklet entitled The End of the World still exists today, and it can't be bought from the owners mm. at any price. Wow. They still have that book. At the same time, uh, Doc Haddon, as he was referred to, and his wife, Maisie, she died in 1911. They had three sons, Charles Samuel. He died in infancy. John Morgan, who was a brilliant young man who was graduated from Milligan College and was teaching school, studying law, when he died from tuberculosis at the age of 29 in 1895. And then there was George Powell, who married Caldona Branham. There were two daughters, Mary Bell, who married Mac Whitaker, and Lydia Ann, who married Noah Sowards. The sad thing about it, Steve, Dr. Haddon later in life admitted that there was no male heir to carry on the Haddon name in southwest Virginia. 
You know, and Steve, not only was he a doctor, but at the same time, he qualified for a justice of the peace in the Robertson Magisterial District. He was also a postmaster until he was 91 years old. He corresponded with his brothers and sisters back in England and wherever for over 50 years. And then there were letters sent back to England by relatives over there, which were written by Dr. Haddon in 1875, 1888, and 1926. But he died on August 7th, 1936, at the age of 94 years old, died of no specific disease, but he was a gentle and also you know, loving man, caring man as to what he did. But he quietly slipped away among the shadows to be forever remembered by his descendants in the community in which he served. And, you know, there's a part now in south of the mountain known as Haddonfield. And that's what is known by Doc Lawrence Haddon. And that's another story in the history of Appalachia. One of many that we tell you right here on Stories, a History of Appalachia. We appreciate you listening to the podcast. And if you'd like to subscribe to it, you can do so by going to iTunes or to your iPhone podcast app. You can also subscribe to the podcast on your favorite Android or Windows phone podcast app. We're also on Facebook. Come by and like us. We've got other stories to tell on our Facebook page. And we're on Twitter as well, at Story Appalachia. And don't forget that we also have an online radio station called Stories Radio. You can go to the uh, TuneIn app and search for Stories Radio. Be sure to list us as one of your favorites. And you can hear this and other stories from the podcast, as well as things that we don't put on the podcast, right there on Stories Radio. So y'all take care. Until next time, so long, everybody. 